Welcome. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Nicholas Chapman and I'm the director of Holy Trinity Publications. And we're here tonight to celebrate the publication of a book from one of our two imprints, which is Holy Trinity Seminary Press. And that book, of course, is The Foundations of Russian Culture uh, by Father Alexander Schmemann. A, few, a brief overview of what we're going to be doing. Uh, we're going to have several people who I will introduce in turn who are going to say a few words. Uh, then I'm going to be conducting a conversation with Serge Schmemann on my left. Uh, then uh, Nicholas Suzhevsky on my right will say a few words about religious books for Russia. Uh, and then we will sing the Our Father and adjourn to the wider space behind for refreshments and an opportunity to mix and mingle. So with no further ado, uh, I would like to introduce His Eminence Metropolitan Nicholas in front of me, who is the first hierarch of the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, um, has been in that capacity for just over a year now, and he also is the Bishop of the Eastern American Diocese, which stretches from, I think, Maine to Puerto Rico. So he, he is racking up the frequent flyer miles, amongst many other good works. And so, Vladika. May God bless this evening and each of us. No? It's wonderful to be here and also wonderful to have the copy of the Kursk icon here, which for so many centuries has been guiding and uniting the Orthodox people. And we feel this today. I am happy to be with you all this evening to celebrate the publication of Father Alexander Schmemann's Foundations of Russian Culture, the latest book from our Holy Trinity Seminary Press. Virgil Presbyter Alexander was one of the most widely recognized voices of the 20th century Russian immigration, whose words reached beyond the Iron Curtain through the vehicle of his radio broadcasts alongside his writings. The collection of his talks found in this book were originally given in Russian more than half a century ago, but they touch on themes that span many generations. The struggle to produce a national culture that is both distinct but also open, dominated neither by fear or too easy acquiescent to new influences from outside itself. Father Alexander notes in one of his first talks that Orthodox Christianity was adopted by Rus simultaneously as faith and as culture, and consequently, the maximalism inherent in the Christian faith also proved in practice to be one of the chief foundations of the new culture. Thus, the struggles to achieve a flowering of Russian culture that Father Alexander analyzes cannot be separated from the daily and never-ending need to cultivate an authentic Christian faith whose fruit is a life pleasing to God as he rightly concludes in his final talk, the eternal foundation of Russian culture, uh, which we have been speaking in these talks, is more profound and more powerful than culture alone. The foundation is the image of eternity, which is inborn in Russia at the very outset of her history, and to which Russian culture remains faithful. Some words just to think about. And I thank those that made this evening possible. The publication, the translation, of course, our wonderful gathering. Thank you, and may God bless and protect all of you. We're rather spatially challenged here, but I'd like to next introduce um, Archpriest Viktor Potapov, who's also in front of me here, who is the rector of St. John the Baptist Russian Orthodox Cathedral here in Washington, D.C., and who extended to us the uh, gift of, of reading the book in the original Russian and enthusiastically commended it to us, and he will say a little bit about the book now. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here in the presence of so many friends of Father Alexander, his family. Um, 
when I came into this room and I saw the Kursk Rude Icon, I remembered uh, how in 1983 um, the Icon was visiting Washington, D.C., and Father Alexander was on his last leg, so to speak. And on the way back to New York with the Icon to Synod, I, I called Father Alexander's home. He picked up the phone himself, and I offered to bring the icon uh, and pray before the original icon with him. And he said he was very, very glad to have the icon. And uh, when I arrived, he opened the door for me, too. He was very thin because of the chemotherapy and all that. And uh, we spent a wonderful evening together. I, um, he, he was too frail to, to I, you know, every, back then I worked for the Voice of America, a radio station. I did religious broadcasting there at the Russian service. And uh, everywhere I went, I carried a micro, uh, tape recorder, a little cassette tape recorder back then. And I wanted to interview him, but I felt it was not, not possible because of his frailty. But I remembered him telling me Interesting about Father John Meyendorf. Um, he considered Father John to be a first class uh, theologian. And I remember Father John telling me that Father Alexander's calling in life was literary criticism. He, he felt that Father, Father uh, Alexander was an outstanding um, interpreter of Russian culture. Um, of course, I went to the funeral later. Uh, it was a like really like Pascha, I would I would I would say. And of course, uh, in the Vestnik of the Russian Christian Youth Movement, they published uh, his final sermon. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was a Thanksgiving Day sermon when he was in, in really bad shape, and he basically was asking his listeners to th thank God for all things, even trials, misfortunes, and illnesses. Very powerful. And I, I was so taken by, by his words that I broadcast them on The Voice of America. Speaking of, uh, there were three people in my life who really inspired me to do what I did for 30 years at the Voice of America. It was Metropolitan Anthony Bloom, Bishop Basil Radzianko, or Metropolitan Anthony, of course, broadcast for the BBC to Russia, uh, as did Bishop uh, Basil, my wife's uncle, also a relative of Father Alexandre, I'm sure. <laughs> and the third person was, of course, Father Alexander. Um, he was beloved in Russia. He had a phonogenic voice. Uh, when you listened to him, you could hear in his voice real authority. So I'm forever grateful to him for inspiring me. I remember listening, uh, painting my apartment in Nyack, New York, where I was a deacon. I would listen to their cassettes, and I would wonder to myself, wouldn't it be wonderful to do the same thing? And uh, well, I guess through the prayers of these three gentlemen and their inspiration, I was able to do that. Anyway, I, I look forward to hearing the other presentations this evening and uh, some little fellowship with all of you, whom I, many of whom I haven't seen in a long, long time because of COVID and other, other issues that uh, plague uh, our country. God bless you all for coming. Thank you. Last but by no means least in our first three, I'd like to introduce uh, Nicholas Shedlovsky, uh, who is the Dean of Holy Trinity Seminary and who brought this project with great enthusiasm to our publications department. Okay. Well, I do have something here. Your Eminence and dear fathers, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. 
What a pleasure it is to see so many friends, some of whom I know have traveled quite a distance to be here at tonight's event. As the back cover of the book states, this is a deceptively modest volume uh, that we are speaking about because in it, Father Alexander actually accomplishes so many important things, some of which will doubtless be spotlighted in our ensuing discussion in just a moment. But for me, I have to say that regardless of anything else, my own focus in respect to this book originates in one overriding realization, and it is with the aim of very briefly sharing this with you that I will immediately allude to and cite the very juicy sounding Russian word, probably one of the very best words that I can find to characterize what Father Alexander attains in his discussions. Openness, impartiality, open-mindedness, detachment, complete fairness, um, no judgmentalism, and finally, a total preparedness for new conversation and dialogue. What nepredvzyatis, that word just embraces all of those things. In testing and, uh, and evaluation of this remarkable ed edifice of intellect and erudition that Father Alexander has put before us here, and which is now available in English for the first time, is almost sure to begin right away <clears throat> to in multiple quarters, probably sooner than we can expect. Let's see about that. But upon weighing all sides of what readers will start to find between these covers, all of us, I feel, will be sure to arrive at least one summary conclusion. My point is that while Father Alexander's book envelops so many things, <clears throat> at bottom, what it is really about will emerge mainly as an invitation, a rather resolute invitation, albeit a gentlemanly one, which Father Alexander was, but one that insists on a mandate to explore the very essence of what it will take for us to begin untying those countless knots of Russian culture that have baffled so many historians in the past, and to do this with a brand new set of eyes, or at least a thoroughly cleansed pair of spectacles. As we read the book, we quickly realize that preconceived historiography, ideology, religious proselytization, political competitiveness, and all other things that normally feed into, well -known, into the well-known arena of cultural power play are simply not present in Father Alexander's book. Just as so many aspects of what is often blindly linked to popular concept of so-called Russianness or Ruskest, starting with an ability to speak and read the Russian language or to be legally a citizen, a citizen of that um, earthly expanse that has been circumscribed in atlases as Russia, formerly the Soviet Union. I would only underscore how very striking it is that this book is completely non-reliant on any advocacy of religious dogma or any other possible spiritual teaching, coming especially from someone who was himself such a committed Christian and moreover a leading prelate of the Orthodox Church. This should really make us stop to wonder and think about the author's complete lack of bias as a person and someone with just a simple humanitarian intention in his discussion and assessment of this enormous subject. Simply put, we can say that yes, Father Alexander's book is an invitation, but while being totally open, it is nevertheless an invitation towards a specific, determinate, conscious, doing away with all the prejudices that normally obstruct meaningful and constructive discussion. I have just listed some of these that have always served as a sad springboard for so much historically entrenched self-righteousness, self-centered justification, animosity, and countless other forms of civil strife that have in past times so easily brought about even tragic revolution. 
So I leave you with one purposeful question. Who is it among today's readers that will come to accept this book's invitation? Who is it in our midst that will be willing and able to embrace the very core of what this book strives to tell us? Namely, that in dealing properly with this complex subject, nothing short of a clean slate is necessary for all of our hearts and minds. As the author himself demonstrates, without this, it is simply not possible to approach the Russian soul, nor to discern where it has been in so many of its past trajectories and for so many centuries of its renowned fleeting existence. I have to say that somehow, in my gut, I have a feeling that the response to my question may actually come in a surprising way. For I do believe in a powerful and positive destiny for this tiny book, which will probably soon find for itself quite an interested and widespread readership, a public that will be completely ready and capable of positively reacting to it and bringing it to some very wonderful fruition with great consequence for everyone to begin to see, to appreciate, to assimilate, and to begin cherishing in our own way. Only time will tell, but I sure hope that I'm not too far off the mark with this kind of optimistic expectation. Thank you very much. I've, I've now been wired up for the interview, which means I think I can no, long, no longer stand up. So if I may just very quickly, um, I'd like to acknowledge two people here who don't know this is about to happen. Uh, Father Nathan Williams over here, who, if you could stand, who is the translator of our book. So thank you very much for all your work. And Marilyn Schwezy over here on my right, for, who is the member of the club who has made the whole evening here possible. And I want to thank her and also the staff of the club for all the work they've already done and and will be doing. So, without further ado, and conscious that I'm wearing a watch that doesn't really keep very good time, I it's 75 years old or so, um, I'm going to turn to introduce the gentleman on my left, who we have known each other now for probably 45 minutes or so. Um, but we, ha we, have, we have been getting acquainted by the more modern means of email and long distance telephone calls. And it's a, it's a great delight to welcome Serge Schmemann here, who I'm sure is probably better known to most of you than to me in, in person. And I, I have a little resume um, of his many achievements here, and I don't trust my memory, so I'm going to look at my little piece of paper and hope that I'm not about to say any falsehoods about you. So you're both an award-winning journalist, writer, and broadcaster. You've won a Pulitzer Prize for your coverage of German reunification and an Emmy in 2003 for your work on a TV documentary about the Israeli and Palestinian conflict. Uh, you've been the deputy foreign editor of the New York Times from 1999 to 2001, having previously served as their correspondent and bureau chief in Moscow, Bonn, and Jerusalem, and at the United Nations. So therefore, I read that you must have some diplomatic ability. Journalism is out. not diplomacy. <laughs> So from 2003 to 2013, you worked as the editorial page manager of the International Herald Tribune in Paris, and there's no greater secular pleasure in life than sitting in a street cafe in Paris and reading the International Herald Tribune with a, either a nice cup of coffee or in Brussels with a large beer. So on that note, we will begin. I, oh, I failed to mention. Uh, also, the author of two books, uh, and in particular perhaps re the relevance to this discussion, Echoes of a Native Land, two centuries of a Russian village. And that really serves as the, the kickoff, uh, for our, if you like, for our discussion. I have many memories in life myself now, and one of those is, I believe, September 1992 in Moscow. And somebody, I don't remember who, it's possible he's sitting in this room, but I'm not sure, uh, introdu <laughs> introduced me uh, to a Greek journalist who was a correspondent for some Greek agency in Moscow. And he took me on a Sunday afternoon somewhere to the south of the city and introduced me to a priest in his matushka. They had built a, or reconstructed a beautiful country church and they had barns built in a traditional Russian style. <coughs> it was, it, everything just, it was a beautiful sunny, sunny afternoon, which I'm sure helped. And 
I, I said to the priest, whose name I don't remember, I said, what, you know, what, what's the inspiration for all, the, all of this creation that you've done here? And he said simply, our spiritual father. So I said to him, and, and who is your spiritual father? And he said, Father Alexander Schmemann, whom of course he had never known in the flesh, but he had listened to on the radio and, and read probably mostly in Samizdat. So to kick off the question, do you, do you think Father Alexander would have recognized this kind of Russian rural idyll as some way an, ex an authentic expression of, of the Russian culture hmm. he discusses in this book? Well, I do wonder, but let me first uh, uh, thank your eminence and fathers and uh, ladies, gentlemen, friends uh, for coming here to, to welcome this book, which I also warmly welcome. I'd like to thank very much uh, Nicholas Yershedlovsky. As Father Victor would say, he's also a relative. That's the way it works uh, in our little world. Mm -hmm. And to thank you for guiding this, for the wonderful translation. I mean, this has really been a work of love from the time you first emailed me and told me what this means to you. It, it's been quite an impressive and, and very rapid project. And I mean, I'm person, personally enormously grateful that uh, you've done this, and I think it will be an important publication. Um, I'd like to say to Father Victor that I was there when you brought that icon to our house, mm. and um, that remains. Told the truth. Hmm? That told the truth. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. It was a very moving moment, which I know meant a lot to my father. Forty years ago, it was now, and uh, to me too. I mean, I thought it was an incredible. Uh, thing to do in the last uh, weeks of his life, maybe already the last days by then, and meant a lot to him, and I'm sure uh, to me it's an indelible memory, so thank you for that. Now to get to your question about this priest and his matushka living in a rural idol, and whether that, I guess, fits into Father Alexander's image of Russian culture, probably not. Hmm. Um, in the way he discusses culture in this book, the culture he analyzes and in which he really lived. I think Father John Meindorf was probably right. He would have been a literary critic in Russia, quite likely. He certainly read and memorized Russian literature prodigiously. Uh, Father Alexander could probably recite all of Pushkin quite easily. and. Um, most of Bloch, I'm sure, but uh, his memory was extraordinary. I remember one day we went to listen to Brodsky when he came out, and on the drive home he was reciting what Brodsky had read. Uh, so his memory, especially for poetry, was extraordinary. But the culture he writes about, it, I think, and, and you know, I really feel inadequate to, to try to reconstruct what he would have thought because in this field he was way ahead of me. But he was speaking of a rather elite culture, the culture of the Russian intelligentsia. He speaks of uh, the peasantry, the narod, the people, as um, that old Russia, that's sort of the third branch of Russian culture he describes. Uh, and. Um, so these people might not have been part of his kind of analysis of, of the high culture that the book is about or that these broadcasts were about. But I am not surprised that people living in that idol would have seen in him a guide because that was the other part of what figured in all his other Radio Liberty broadcasts. We have a gentleman here who remembers the good old days of Radio Liberty who did a wonderful book about it. Um, and um, it, it was repeated there, and it was repeated in that last sermon mm -hmm. Father Victor described. It was basically the joy of life. It's not, you know, the, the orthodoxy he projected through his broadcasts was, was to embrace life here and now. It's, it's not the escape, it's not, sort of uh, disappearing into the wilderness and only hoping to die as soon as possible. It was living fully and now. And so I can see and have seen as well in Russia people who, who listened to him, who read him, 
who would have embraced that vision and maybe gone on to construct this perfect little rural idol. Yes. Um, I, I did meet a lot of people like that in Russia mm -hmm. and heard many similar stories of, of what his words meant. And I think part of his ministry in America, too, was just going out there. I think he liked nothing better than going to some little city in the coal country of Pittsburgh and after liturgy to go down to the basement and to eat kielbasa with all the local folks. That kind of communion, that kind of joy and just the life people lived would have been very much part. So yeah. I, I don't know if that fits into the discussion of culture, but certainly into the discussion of okay. faith and life. But you've, you've highlighted in your answer that clearly literature is very central to his vision of culture and Pushkin in particular. So can we, can you extrapolate from Pushkin in particular, uh, the components, the contours of, of culture that he would have understood were the, the lessons perhaps that he might hope people would come away with having read Pushkin particularly? Well, he keeps uh, several times in the book, in, well, I keep referring it to a book in Will, but it's really broadcast. Mm -hmm. He refers, Pushkin is our all. This kind of uh, image of Pushkin is the definition of, of kind of the, the post-Peter the Great explosion of, of Russian literature. Um, and, you know, I, I also wondered, going through this, when it came out in Russia, he talks about culture, but he really writes about literature. There's mm -hmm. really not a word about music or art mm -hmm. or ballet or... Um, it's, it's all about literature. But I think it's fair. I think because, because literature became perhaps the, the metric of, of Russian mm. development, of, of uh, Russian self-awareness, identity. You know, every Russian can quote things from Pushkin, from mm. Kapitanska, Deutsch, from Medniv Sadnik, from something. It, it became kind of the vocabulary of the Russian intelligentsia. And I think it also defined, it was through literature that, that you could trace the various strands of Russian intellectual development uh, and Russian spiritual development. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it was in Dostoevsky, in, in, in Tolstoy, all of them kind of were the various directions in which the Russian um, consciousness, in which Russian identity was developed. Uh, ballet, art, they followed music mm -hmm. and, and they contributed and they were certainly part of it. But the, uh, the literature, the poetry especially, was, well, not only especially, poetry and the great novels were the metric by which this culture could be tracked and followed. Yes, and I'm going a little bit off our pre-agreed script, if you like, here, but it struck me that he very much talks of the, the importance of the idea of a certain universalism in culture, which I, th I think he ascribes originally to the if you like, the Byzantine inheritance, uh, first of all, in Kiev and Rus. And is, how, how, how do you think that is seen as developing? Because the, the literary corpus, unless I'm mistaken, that's mostly being referred to is relatively recent in the span of a thousand years. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, that was perhaps the most interesting part of this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I am certainly not an expert on, on Russian literature mm -hmm. uh, or even on Russian culture. I mean, but I grew up in a Russian setting. But to, to, to read about how, uh, what accepting the Byzantine faith meant and how, mm -hmm. while for Byzantium, it, it was a synthesis of Hellenic uh, culture, mm -hmm. Roman culture, orthodoxy. In Russia, it just came and basically landed on, on a rocky ground and became everything. Mm -hmm. I think in the other question, yes. you might have wanted to ask about the maximalism. That's yes. where, where religion yes. became the entire kind of uh, culture of that ancient Russia uh, without sort of absorbing any, any local tradition that might have preceded mm -hmm. it. So uh, that perhaps is a distinction with, with Byzantium, but also it leads to that huge explosion of creativity that came with Peter the Great's mm -hmm. opening to the West. 
yeah. And that's, that seems to be the, the challenge he, he poses is how, how one or how Russia can carry a universal or inheritance, if you like, without becoming, if you like, messianically fanatic, if I could perhaps put it that way, mm -hmm. um, if that's a, a real expression. Uh, in one of his talks, and this you just referred to this a second ago, and I'm going to quote here, so I'll read. He says, religious, religious maximalism often transforms into historical and cultural minimalism, on page 33, for mm -hmm. those who are interested. Now, to me, this was, a, in some ways, a surprising thing for an Orthodox priest to say, and it seemed to me to, again, contrast to something that was said to me by a priest in Moscow in the 90s, when mm. I'm approximately quoting, who said, the aim of preaching the gospel is the creation of authentic culture. Um, so how, how does one reconcile those statements if one can? What, what, is, what, is, mm. what, what was and perhaps is the fear of religious maximalism? What's tied up in that? Yeah, I think to me it seemed the, the quote referred to the maximalism perhaps of the pre-Peter culture, mm -hmm. where religion was everything, where, where the debates, uh, you know, between Avakum and Nikon uh, were, were total, you know, it's, it's, I have the truth, no, I have the truth. I would say a bit of that survives in Russian culture. Mm -hmm. One of uh, my friends in Russia, Evgeny Kisilov, who used to be a major announcer on television, once told me, the difference between the West and Russia is in the West you say, I disagree. In Russia you say, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I find that to be this kind of yes. uh, maximalism that he refers to. The debates were yes. to the death. Um, and, um, and that led to what he describes yeah. as the minimalism of the state, which then does not concern itself with anything but the most uh, mundane of tasks. But um, I think, I don't know, I did, wasn't there when you spoke to that priest, no, and I would have no. loved to see the context. <laughs> but, but he spoke in a context where uh, the church was emerging from a period of total suppression, where finally it was allowed again to participate in culture. Uh, and so it's, it's the context and the perspective that changes. And in 91, it would have appeared mm -hmm. uh, to this priest that the sermon now contributes to the creation of this new culture that will follow. I mean, it, it reminds me and probably some other people who were in Russia at the time of the enormous optimism we all felt in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Where, where the word, the gospel, would become part of the new culture that would supplant the tyranny. Um, we can argue, and don't need to argue, it hasn't quite happened that way. But uh, I don't see, therefore, a contradiction. Where mm -hmm. the, the reference is to different periods <coughs> and to different movements, to different dynamics. Yes. Which brings us conveniently, I think, onto my, my last question, which is in your foreword to the book, and again, I'm going to read because I'm going to quote, uh, you mentioned a speech of your father's uh, where he says that Russian Christians need to ensure, and I quote, that Russia can have a spiritual fate. Uh, given the current nadir in relations between Russia and the West, how do you perceive we might now be able to contribute in a positive way to the spiritual fate of Russia? Well, this, Easy of course, question. is the elephant in the room, isn't it? Uh, this book comes out mm. at a terrible time. Mm. And um, you had sent me these questions before, so I looked at them quite literally, and you spoke here of um, the problem of relations between Russia and the West. I have to be honest, I don't see that as the problem. It is a massive problem, of course, but to me the problem is Russia's relations, obviously with Ukraine, but also with itself. Mm -hmm. what, what we're watching here is, is a process that um, follows many of the tragedies of Russian history where Russian culture, Russian religion, um, 
much of what is good in Russia is being co-opted, again, by the state, and being co-opted in the service of something truly terrible. And um, you know, I will not conceal that I consider this war on Ukraine to be utterly disastrous and evil and, and indefensible. But how it ties in with, with, with Russian culture is, again, the question. My father gave these talks in the 70s. You know, that was a time of enormous optimism. Yes, it was still Brezhnev. I mean, we, we were not in Russia yet, but we got there in 1980 and spent the next five years. And even though it was, you know, every dissident was being arrested and everything horrible was happening, but you knew it was going to change. Mm -hmm. uh, my father in the 70s, I remember in our conversations, uh, if you follow, again, these scripts, you will see his, his kind of sense in the, that the, the, um, the death of Bloch, the suicide of Mayakovsky, that there was a kind of a literature coming to an end, a culture that was just being crushed by Stalin. And then there was this silence during the war. We knew nothing. And then suddenly in the 60s, it begins to rise up again. Uh, one day in the life of Ivan Zinisevich. You know, I remember how he celebrated that. He began the Radio Liberty uh, broadcasts in the 50s. Mm -hmm. He had no idea whether anybody's listening. He had no idea whether there was anything there to which he could speak. And suddenly in the 60s, it begins to come back. I remember we went to see Andrei Tarkovsky's film, Andrei Rublev. Mm -hmm. um, and for him, it was just a sign that Russian culture, the culture that for him seemed to have ended with a silver age, was, was again being reborn. So he wrote his scripts. These scripts were in a period of enormous, not enormous, but a sense that it will get better, that mm -hmm. there is progress, that things are moving in a certain direction. There is more literature. There is more coming out. Uh, you know, Solzhenitsyn for him was the major example mm -hmm. then, but so was everybody else who was writing at that time. It was an exciting period. Um, and now to, to watch a Russia that, you know, is no longer under the heel of a, of a communist party, but to, to, to be surrendering this culture. A million people have fled, the best. Some of them are sitting here. Um, you know, have had to flee the country. Uh, writers, journalists are being thrown in prison. You have to call a war a special operation. You know, words are being devised. In this. So to me, the problem here is, yes, there is a problem with the West, an enormous problem. It worries me. I write about it a lot. It's my subject. But in this context, the real problem is whether, uh, as you phrased it, whether Russian culture uh, can again redeem Russia, whether again Russian writers, but not only, can, can begin that kind of profound opposition, the role they had uh, throughout Russian history. I mean, you can't think of a writer, Pushkin, Lermontov, uh, Dostoevsky was nearly shot, I mean, every one of them, uh, who wasn't in opposition. Culture was sort of the word, the, the moral force that opposed the state. In the Soviet times, when I was there in the 80s, um, it was certainly that force. Mm -hmm. You know, one after another, writers were being exiled and continuing. Uh, whether Russian culture can again come to Russia's salvation, that's the yeah. question I take away yes. from this book. Yes. This book was written when when there was optimism in the air. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no idea how my father would react to today. I make a very stern practice of not speaking in his name because he was mm -hmm. vastly more erudite than I am and, and uh, not somebody I want to pretend I would know what he would say. But mm -hmm. boy, do I miss his wisdom right now. Right. Thank you. I was explaining to somebody earlier that the name Chapman is Old English for traveling bookseller. So it would be very remiss of me not to mention that on your seats were a, a copy of the book. I want to 
you will find in, in the back of the book a list of all the people who made this project possible. I'm not going to read all your names now. Uh, many of you are here, and so again, very big thank you to you.